whistler. I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. The man sitting alone is a stranger here. He has means and a responsible position in society. He's a man who is more at home in a fashionable club than in a waterfront bar. But tonight he has turned from the comfort and security of his own world to meet a man whose business is death. know my name? No. I want to have a man removed. Oh. Well, um, what does this fellow do? Does that make any difference? Yes, it makes a lot of difference. You see, if he's important, I won't touch it. Just a small manufacturer? Oh, legitimate businessman. You see, a murder of a chap like that will get a lot of publicity. Well, if it's the money you're thinking about, I'm prepared to pay you well. Pay 10000 to handle it. You see, I have to split with the gentleman who actually does the work. Of course, he'll never know who's putting up the money. And I don't want to know who he is. You won't. What's the name and address of the party? I'm not the type to take payment for a job and not deliver. And that goes for those who work for me. Well, that's what I've been told. What are you worrying about? The time must be done between now and next Friday. It will be. Fella back there wants you. Say, I think he the doesn't fella back there. understand a word you say, Mister. He's a deaf mute. Oh. Deliver this. Deliver this. You know where. Right away. You understand? And don't lose it. all set. I'm sending some details over to you. How many details? Five. I'll give you a fancy job for that. Never mind anything fancy. Just play it safe. It has to be done by next Friday night. Okay.
You expecting to meet anybody outside? No. I'm afraid you will if you leave by the front door. Yeah? Thanks, Gus. Maybe so, but your name was Gorse when you killed a cop in St. Louis three years ago. I didn't get him up. Drop it! What? say so, sir. You're looking very much better. Come in the study for a minute, will you, Jennings? Very well, sir. Sit down, Jennings. Is there anything wrong, sir? Of course not. Sit down. Pour us each a brandy, Jennings. Very well, sir. Why is it you've never married? Well, sir? One set of family responsibilities at a time is sufficient. Sir. Oh, come now. I haven't been as difficult as all that. <laughs> You're very good help, Mr. Conrad. May it continue to improve, sir. Thanks. Uh, I've been awfully worried lately, sir. I thought perhaps that you... You mean you thought I've been cracking up? In a way, sir. Well, you can put your mind at rest. Everything's going to be all right now. Well, I'm awfully glad to hear it, sir. By the way, where was it you wanted to own an orange grove? <laughs> At Riverside, sir. Dunning, you're fired. I want you to leave for Riverside in the morning. Here's your severance pay. But I really don't care for oranges, sir. <laughs> Except for a slice in an old fashioned. Well, you wanted an orange grove, now you're stuck with one. But how about you in the house, sir? You always said you wouldn't have anything changed from the way that Mrs. Conrad left it. And that includes me, sir. I'm giving up the house, Jennings. And where I'm going, quarters will be a little cramped for both of us. Foster. Oh, well, good morning, Mr. Conrad. Hello. Hello, Myrtle. Tell Mr. McNear that Mr. Conrad is in today. He looks fine, like a different person. Good morning, Alice. Earl, I'm certainly glad you came in today. Well, don't you start on me. Come inside, will you, please? Much work piled up? I was able to handle most of it. Has 
Mr. McNair been worried about my absences? After all, he is your partner. Something's happened to you, Earl. You're, you're different. If I seem less upset, it's because I've become reconciled to Claire's death. You're wise to try and forget. I, I think it's best that way. Not much chance of my forgetting. My friends have taken care of that. Well, you dropped all your friends. They'd changed. They weren't the same any longer. Oh, you imagine that, Earl. The trip was my idea. It took a lot of persuading to get Claire to go. You see, something had happened to our marriage. We drifted apart. Even thought of separating. Why, I always thought yes, you... Yes, I know. I didn't mention to you or McNair because I didn't want to bring my domestic troubles into the office. I talked Claire into making the trip. I'd even hoped that it might bring us together again. Most of our friends knew that we were having trouble. You can imagine how they reacted when I came back alone. No. She was in my arms in the water. I let go of her to reach for a raft that was floating past. When I looked back, she was gone. But you helped other people onto the raft. Well, that's exactly the point. Our friends have been wondering why I was unable to get my wife on the raft when I was able to help others. Do you mean anyone has suggested you, you deliberately let Claire drown? Oh, no. No one has been as crude as that. But I felt the accusation in their eyes. Oh, you're mistaken, Earl. You must be mistaken. No. No, you sense a thing like that even more strongly than if it were put in words. Oh, come in, Charlie. Hello, Earl. Uh... Miss Walker, I'll see anybody today. Look here, Earl. You're not being fair to me. I think we'd better come to an understanding. About what? For months now, you've been coming to the office only once or twice a week, and then for only a couple of hours. Well, I have been myself, Charlie. Everything's going to be all right now. I know, Earl, I know, but you know I wouldn't have invested my money in a business I know nothing about if you had to show me you were going to give it all your attention. Well, what would you do if I had an accident? Well, I, I... I'll tell you what you'd do. Absolutely nothing. I've taught Miss Walker all there is to know about this business. And I'm leaving her my share of the firm, so she'll never run out on you. You can just relax and enjoy yourself. How do you do? I'd like to speak to Mr. Conrad. My name is Smith. Well, Mr. Conrad is busy just now. Well, I'll wait. You may go in now, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Well, good morning, Mr. Conrad. My, you have lovely offices. My name is Smith. Oh, it's a pleasure to meet a successful businessman like you. One that's successful and also accessible. Willing to sit down, talk business, doesn't have those keep-out signs on the door. What can I do for you? These are specimen policies, Mr. Conrad. Uh, I came to talk to you about life insurance. Oh, a little warm, isn't it? I'm with the Atlantic Mutual. And my company has developed a very special type of policy for a man in your position. You could forget all the drivel. Hurry up and get it over with. Oh, well, now, don't rush me, Mr. Conrad. I'll get it over with. I don't need any life insurance. Oh, I think you do. As a matter of fact, I canceled all my policies yesterday. Oh. Well, now, was that fair to your partner? Maybe the business would require additional capital if something unexpected ever happened to you. Nothing unexpected is going to happen to me. Oh, I wouldn't be too sure about that, Mr. Conrad. Life is so uncertain, you know. One moment you're alive and the next you're dead. Nobody knows what's waiting around the corner. Now, take your own case, for example. You live alone, that is, except for your butler. Did you ever think of this? A short circuit at night? A fire? Why, you could be suffocated to death without ever waking up. As a matter of fact, my company just paid one of these partnership claims. One partner wanted to go hunting. He took the shotgun out of the case to look at it. First thing he knew, he'd blown his head off. Now, what makes you so sure that nothing unexpected is going to happen to you? Well, I'm sure that I don't need any life insurance. Well, well, maybe you want to get married again. Oh, you'd better take out a policy now, Mr. Conrad, while you can still pass the physical examination. Get out. But, Mr. Conrad, I... Get out. Well, all right. But thanks so much for the interview. I'll see you again sometime. Thank <laughs> you. 
Who's in here? Who's in here? Mr. Conrad? Yes. I understand your phone's out of order. Have I sent you this time of night? Well, you're lucky to get service at any time these days. You want to come inside? Roughly, that's the idea. Unless you keep your phone out here on the porch. Have you ever heard the theory that it's impossible for anyone to go into a room without leaving behind some trace of their presence? Well, look, you want me to fix your phone or don't you? There's nothing wrong with my phone. Well, somebody reported it out of order. Come in and look for yourself. Now, I'm all alone, so you can forget the pretense of the phone and get it over with. Get what over with? I don't know why you came here. It's all right. Go ahead and do it. See? It's dead. The wire's been cut. As soon as I get this fixed, you better call the police. Yes, I will. Okay. Your line's in. You can call the police now. Or you can ride downtown with me if you want to. Oh, I'll be all right now, thanks. Well, good night. Good night. Much flies. I tried to phone you, but your line is out of order. Yes, I know. Come into the study. Earl, Jennings came to see me tonight. We both thought it strange that you'd given him $5,000 in cash as a gift and and we're in such a hurry to get him out of the house. Why, I let Jennings go because I'm giving up the house. I wish I could believe that. It's the truth. I feel as if you're going through some sort of crisis, Earl. You've been perfectly swell. But there isn't anything more that you can do for me. I wish there was something I could do that would really help you. Perhaps I'd better go. Would you mind seeing me home? Did you hear someone whistling? I didn't notice. I hope my being here hasn't upset you. I persuaded your landlady to let me in. What'd you do, tell her I was your son? Heaven forbid. Get your belongings together, will you? I want you to take a trip south with me. I won't tie it up. I got a job I inherited from Lefty Vigrant. When'll you be ready to leave? Well, I expect it'll be through tonight, but I was interrupted. Oh, that's what made you so jumpy, huh? Yeah. I had a feeling I was being watched. Then I thought I heard somebody whistling. Still got time to make the train tonight. 
I've been paid. I gotta deliver. Well, that's highly ethical. Oh, now, don't be funny. Look, why don't you go away with me for a couple of days? Then you can come back when you like. Naturally, the town's hot right now after a vagrant tried to shoot it out with the police. Yeah, but I gotta finish this job by Friday. Well, I'll tell you, I'll be at the Majestic Hotel for the next couple of days. If you change your mind, look me up there. <laughs> Studies and necrophobia. Exaggerated fear of death. <laughs> I like it. Why don't you try raising orchids for a hobby? That stuff like that alone. It's liable to awaken your imagination. A fellow like you is better off without it. Hey, wait a minute. Thanks for reminding me of this book. You give me an idea. Yeah. Maybe I can knock this guy off without killing him myself. What's that? Do you know that some people actually die of fright? See you at the hotel. I've been trying to get you on the phone. I've got wonderful news for you. Oh, come inside, Alice. What's the wonderful news? It's about Claire. She's alive, Earl. I can hardly believe it. Do you think there could possibly be some mistake? Oh, of course not. What she must have been through these last two years. Yes, I know, but the joy of coming home will compensate even for that. Thanks, Alice. Not only is Claire released, but I can go on living again. Do you realize what that means? I can look at my friends without seeing murder in their eyes. I... I... What's the matter, Earl? Oh, nothing, nothing serious. I, I've got a, a call to make. I'll be back in a little while. Mr. Conrad nearly ran me down in the corridor. Where's he going? Well, I don't know, but he'll be back soon. I came to congratulate him on his good news. She couldn't even wait to hear me. <laughs> I'm surprised to see you looking so cheerful. Why shouldn't I be? Well, his wife's popping up alive must have upset your plans. Now, don't be angry. Everybody but Conrad knows you're in love with him. And I was hoping you'd win. You might have straightened him out. Has uh, Mr. Tomley come in yet? Yeah, he got in a few minutes ago. Well, I guess it's all right for you to go right on in, Mr. Conrad. Thank you. Hello, Tomley. I've been in and out of here all day trying to see you. I want to get in touch with Lefty Vigran right away. Tell him I want to see him as soon as possible, will you? Of course, you don't know Lefty Vigran is dead. No, I didn't. When did it happen? I suppose it's a great surprise to you, but he was killed by detectives as he left that bar room just after your meeting with him. Well, this is a surprise. I, I haven't been reading the papers as much as usual. But, but if Figren is dead, I'll have to get in touch with the man that works with him. I don't know anything about his friends. Well, you knew a lot about Figren the first time I came here. I didn't ask what you wanted him for then, and I don't want to discuss it now. Well, what's the matter, Tomley? You know who I am. Do you think I betrayed Vigran? I wouldn't know. Well, I'm not an informer. All I want is to call off the deal I made. Whoever's got the money is welcome to it. Vigran was a close-lipped man. 
Too bad, but I can't help you. I'd like to speak to you for a moment. Weren't you in here the other night when I was talking to Lefty Vigran? You know, Lefty... You don't understand a word you're saying, mister. He's a deaf mute. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, maybe you can help me. Yeah? Remember I was in here the other night? In that booth over there. With Lefty Vigran? Oh, yeah, I remember. What do you have? A uh, bourbon. Do, uh... Any of Lefty's friends come in? They better not. I didn't know the guy you were with was Viger until after he was shot off in the alley. You know, I'd give a lot to know some of Lefty's friends. Yeah, there were a couple of fellows in here yesterday who said the same thing. They were detectives. Yes, miss? Sherry. I'll have another. Oh, sorry. When you get time. Do you remember exactly what Vigrant did after I left? Sam? Yes, please. He made a phone call, I think. Yes, I remember now. He made a phone call, and then he sat at the table at that booth over there. Then he called to a friend of his who was over here at the counter and handed him an envelope, and the guy beat it. Who was he? You'll have to ask Lefty about that, mister. You're lying. Now, wait You know who he is. Take I know you know easy. who he is. I'm sorry. Finding this friend of Vigrant's is a matter of life and death to me. Here's my card. If he comes in again, will you ask him to wait here and phone me? Okay, I'll ask him. Bartender. Go back to the kitchen, I think. Thank you. I want some change. I'd like to play a record. He was lying to you. Let's see what they have on the machine, shall we? Did you know any of Vigrant's friends? Yes. The man who runs this place owns the roadhouse on Mountain View Drive. I used to sing out there. Lefty hung around there all the time. What's the name of it? I uh, hope you like music that's sweet and soft. That's the mood I'm in. What's the name of the roadhouse? The High Hat. I'll show you where it is if you want to go out there. Shall we start now? All right. I should have phoned for a cab. I left my car in a parking lot uptown. Oh, that's all right. Mine's right here. Make you nervous driving around these curves? No. I thought you said this place was just out of town. It isn't much farther. Don't you think we should introduce ourselves? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Earl Conrad. My name is Vigrin. Antoinette Vigrin. You can call me Tony. You mean that you're Lefty Vigrin's wife? Yes. Is it possible that you were Lefty's partner? I was his wife. I know. Did you work with him? Were you actually... Actually the... what? I made a deal with Lefty. I paid him to have something done. Oh, yes. I heard a little about that. I heard all about it. You're the one he told to do it. But everything's changed now. I don't want it done. Don't you see? I've got everything in the world to live... Lefty to have 
have someone kill me because I thought my wife was dead. Now I know she's alive. So don't you see, I don't want to die. You had a wife and you loved her. You didn't want to live without her, is that it? Yes, and I... Don't... I had a husband. I loved him. I don't want to live without him. He left, he was a murderer. I don't know anything about that. All I know is you set him up to be killed. take these curves any faster than I can. Yeah, it sure is. That's all for her. Yeah. Wonder where her boyfriend is. You better go up to the car and report her. All right. I'm gonna take a look around for him. It wasn't Earl Conrad's destiny to go to his death with Antoinette Vigran. to me for a minute and you can do whatever you like I know you're in here Earl Earl you've been in an accident are you hurt I'm all right oh I've been so worried all day when you left the office I thought you'd be back soon why did you turn out the lights in the study well I, I heard someone outside the house but I didn't know it was you by the way who did you think you were talking to when you came into the house I didn't know. I saw the lights go out. I know someone was inside. What did you mean when you said, listen to me for a minute, then do what you like? You're afraid of someone, Earl. Someone you believe is going to kill you. Isn't that true? Now, you run on home, Alice. I'll handle my own affairs. Shall I answer it? No, I will. Don't you come out in the hall, no matter what happens. Who's there? Mr. Conrad? Yes, what is it? We're from the detective bureau. Just a minute till I answer the phone. Never mind, just open the door. I don't believe the detectives. I want to get out and you better come with me.
got a bed? Yeah, 25 cents. You can take bed 11, second row. And pay now. Hmm? Pay now. Hmm. Hey, wait a minute. There you are, 975. Name? Now, you see, in my business, uh, you have to be careful of your reputation. I'm in demand because people know I always go through with anything I start. That reputation is just as valuable to me as yours is to... as yours is to you. Look, I think you're making a fool of yourself. You've been paid. Bagrin's gone. His wife's gone. Who's there to know whether or not you go through with it? The guy that paid left deal, no. He doesn't know you. Anyway, I'm having too good a time to leave town now. Too good a time? Yeah. My psychological experiment's going great. <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm rough shadowing this guy. Rough shadowing? Yeah. That's what detectives call it when they want a guy they're shadowing to see them, you know? Familiar face bobbing up here, there, every place. They tell me that's hard on the nerves. <laughs> there you are. That's what comes of a fellow like you when he reads a book. <laughs> the guy I've got marked knows he's going to get it. All his actions prove that. But he doesn't know when, where, or how, because I don't know that myself yet. Well, how'd you like to be in his spot, Gorman? <laughs> I could have knocked him off long ago, and he's so scared I... I believe I can scare him to death. But you were kidding about that. I never kid. At the right moment, I'll just show him a gun. He'll die a heart failure. Yeah. Maybe I'm on the track of something big. Something new in the art of murder. No fuss. No muss. Huh? Yeah. Suppose he doesn't drop dead. My gun won't be empty. Well, I guess I'll get back to my little playmate now in case he kicks his covers off. Why? Why don't you come with me? What I want you to do is safe and easy. Friday, and I'm your man. A flea bag. This place is fumigated every day. Smells like it. You can take any bed that's vacant. What's your name? Any name. John Smith.
Sergeant Klein, Detective Bureau. What? I was just trying to wake you. Did you come in here to ditch the cops? Huh? You must have flashed a roll in front of that stool pigeon clerk. He's back there telephoning the cops to come and get you. Shh. Take your coat. I'll show you a way to get out of here. Would you like to discuss some life insurance with me? You're not selling insurance. That man Lefty Vigrin hired to kill me. Why don't you stop clowning? You better take out some more insurance today because tomorrow may be too late. There's something I want to explain to you. I'm the man who paid Lefty Vigrin, so I'm the man you're actually working for. Yeah. Now I've changed my mind. I want to call the whole deal off. Well, you can keep the money. I don't care about that. What money? The 5000 that Vigran gave you for killing me. Huh? Now, this is something new. You mean you paid a guy to have yourself knocked off? That's the truth. What do you know about that? That makes you a bad risk. I don't think we can do any more business. Well, it's understood, isn't it? And you agree not to do any more about it. 
Maybe. Now, wait a minute. You seem to forget that I saw you kill a man in the warehouse. What? Oh, you know a lot about me, don't you? Maybe too much. Too much, mate? Come on. Come on, try to get up. That's it. There. What, you ain't drunk? Come on, pull yourself together and I'll take you inside. Steady now. that and you'll find it'll warm me up. Oh, and help yourself to the sugar there. I'll be back in just a minute. I don't think there's much use waiting any longer. Better go home and get some rest. Oh, I'll stay for a while. You can't keep out of everybody's sight indefinitely. If there's anything I can do, call me at home. Thank you. Good night. This is for Mr. Conrad. Thank you. Sign here, please.
Hello? This Excelsior 41352? Yes. Who's speaking, please? Yes. Well, I'll leave immediately. The corner first in Harbor. Thank you. You're not a talkative man, are you, eh? I, uh... Oh, come on. What seems to be the trouble? Are you, are you sick? Just tired, that's all. Well, you can stay here for a while and rest yourself up. Thanks. You seafaring man? I was. I just watched the dock now. See, it isn't being used much, and, well, I've got an easy enough job. When is the ship of the next pier sailing? The Sottenhahn? Say, you're not thinking of shipping out on her, are you? <laughs> Why, that's the Swedish exchange ship. She's chartered by the Red Cross. When's it sailing? You know, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if she pulled out of here tonight. But you've got to be either a Swede sailor or a Jap prisoner to get aboard her. <laughs> I was just curious, that's all. Well, I've got to go on my rounds now. So you, uh, you just stay here and... Rest for a while, and don't you worry if I'm not back for, oh, say, an hour or so. Just, you know, take it easy. Perhaps I'd better go in alone. Watchman? Yes? Ah. Uh, you know, I was afraid he might wander away while I was meeting you. He seemed very much interested in that Red Cross ship at the next pier. Oh. I'd like to go over there. Do you mind going with me? Oh, why, I'd be glad to. Uh... Is this one of your men? No. What are you trying to do on this ship? You're Conrad. He's the amnesia case. His picture was in today's paper. Oh, yes. I read about him myself, Sergeant. Remember who you are? Of course. You look pretty sick. Come on down to the office.
I guess you can handle it without me now, Miss Walker. I can only thank you now, but I wish you'd come to the office tomorrow. That's all right, ma'am. <laughs> but, Mr. Conrad, there's one thing I'd like to know. Exactly why did you try to get on board the ship? Just a minute. I think I can explain that. You see... Police have Conrad now. They'll make him talk. He'll give them your description. And he'll tell them about the murder in the warehouse. If they pick you up, Conrad will identify you. There may come a day when he'll stand up in court and give testimony that will hang you. You hadn't thought of that, had you? This man's destiny to die tonight. Earl Conrad lives because man cannot change his destiny. And after this dark night, he will recover from his mental illness and there will come a new chapter in his life which will bring happiness to him. I know because I am the whistler. Yum. It's time for a tasty and refreshing snack. to satisfy your hunger, your thirst, your sweet tooth. So visit our refreshment center now. Let's go! Wait a minute. Have you heard the whistler? Whistler. If you could look upon Charlie as I do, you'd realize he's inanimate, dead, with no power to harm. That was old Peter Medford, the jungle explorer, now confined to a wheelchair with paralysis. I would suggest that you leave this place at once, Miss Medford. At once. That was Clay Alden, Peter Medford's secretary. And this is Marie, Peter Medford's young niece. No, no, no. It's no dream. It's here. Here in my room. Saturday night, and CBS presents another in the new mystery series, The Whistler. And I, The Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And so I tell you tonight the strange mystery of the shrunken head. In the quickening darkness of a stormy fall evening, a young girl paces the deserted platform of a small suburban railroad station. 
From her anxious attitude, we know that she's waiting for someone. But just be patient, Miss Medford. There is someone coming to meet you. <laughs> he has just now driven up. He's coming through the station door, walking up behind you. Miss Medford? Oh, oh yes, I... Sorry to have kept you waiting. I'm Clay Alden. Oh, yes. Uncle Peter has mentioned you in his letters. Uh, his secretary, aren't you? That's right. Where is my uncle? He was disappointed he couldn't meet you. Pretty much of a task for the old gentleman to get around these days. You see, he's confined to a wheelchair. Oh, I didn't know. Serious? Legs are paralyzed. Result of jungle fever. Just came on him lately. Oh, awful. Yes, it's a shame, all right. Well, shall we get going? Car's out front. Better run for it or you'll get wet. Yes. I'll take care of your luggage. Thank you very much. Rather a disappointing reception, Marie Medford, wouldn't you think? You have come over 2,000 miles all by yourself just to see the only living relative you have in the world. And then you are met by a stranger. The car turns up the tree-lined driveway. This Marie is what is known in this countryside as Medford Manor. Yes, Medford Manor. It's all that the name implies. A gloomy pile of a structure, even made gloomier by the blackness of the night and the driving rain. Oh, someone has heard the car approach. The door is open. It's the butler, Victor. Well, Marie... Are you going in? <laughs> what a pity you don't know what I do. You'd never cross that threshold if you did. Hmm. Too late now. Your luggage is being brought in. The young man and the butler stand beside you. The door closes. Victor? Yes? Take Miss Medford's luggage upstairs to the south corner bedroom. The, the south corner bedroom, sir? Certainly. Why not? Very good, sir. Um, any further instructions? No. Oh, uh, has Mr. Medford retired yet? Uh, not yet, sir. He's in his study. I, I just gave him his... his warm milk. He may have dozed off, sir. All right. Thank you, Victor. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Would you care to follow Victor to your room, Miss Medford? I'd like to see my uncle now, if I could, please. Very well. Come this way. Here we are. I'll speak to him. Wait here, please. Well, Marie, how do you like it? You get a feeling of something not as it should be? <laughs> Strange fellow, this Clay. And the butler, too. Uh, look about you. What a depressing house. Huge and cold and unfriendly. Oh, not at all as you'd imagined it. <laughs> Is it, Marie? Your uncle will see you now. Thank you. Marie, my dear child, come in, come in, come in. Uncle. Well, well, my oh. poor child, take off those wet things at once. Holden, what's the matter with you? My niece will catch her death. Help her off with those things. Sorry, Mr. Medford. Thank you. Bless my soul, pretty as the picture. You got a kiss for us? <laughs> of course. <laughs> That's it. Now you sit down here beside oh, me. Uncle. I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't meet you, my dear, but I, I'm afraid the ravages of old age and malaria have finally caught up with me. My one comfort is this wheelchair. <laughs> Getting onto it, though, you should see me wheeling all over the house. <laughs> the only thing that baffles me is the stairs. My life is now confined to the first floor only. Oh, uh, pretty bad trip, wasn't it? Seems endless. Well, you're here now, thank goodness. This is your home. You're free to come and go and do whatever you please. Thank you, Uncle Peter. Don't suppose any of this is what you imagined? I know that I'm different from what I'd hoped you'd find. <laughs> Tell me, Uncle Peter, do you think you'd have recognized me if you hadn't known I was coming? Recognize you? Why, of course. You have the family of Medford written all over you. Oh. No mistaking you, my dear. Well, Alden, what are you standing there for? What are you staring at? Oh. Waiting to see if you need anything for this. No, 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 no. That's all. I'll ring for you if I need you. Yes, sir. Oh, I forgot to thank him. For what? He gets paid for whatever he does. Forgive me for saying this, but somehow I don't like that young man. Was he rude to you? Oh, no, not actually. 
But he seems to resent my being here. And the butler, he seems resentful, too. I feel as though I don't belong. Oh, they're harmless enough. But getting back to you, I... I was so sorry I was in South America at the time... The time it happened. Must have been pretty ghastly for you, my child. Like a nightmare, Uncle Peter. I'm not myself yet. I should think not. An only child losing both parents so suddenly and... And so horribly. Maybe it was a good thing it was sudden. It had to happen at all. One spectator at the crash said that they never... Never knew what happened. Now, 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 you mustn't talk about it. All that's behind you, a new life from now on. Of course. That's the way I want to look at it, Uncle Peter. And I'd like to get something to do. What? Oh, no. Oh, yes, really, I would. I want to be active if I can. I'm quite capable. I'd really like to get a a job, Uncle Peter. Well, bless my soul. Secretarial work or anything. Well, that, that might not be a bad idea to keep you from brooding. We'll see what we can do. And now, now I have a little surprise for you. You haven't seen my collection. No, I haven't. Mother and father often talked about it. Well, if you'll just open that door over there, I'll show some of it to you. Oh, this one? That's right. Uh, you'll find the light switch just inside. Why? Why, it's a regular museum. All these glass cases. Over here, my dear. Now, look at these. Well, what do you think of them? Why, well, they're horrible, Uncle Peter. They look like, like tiny human heads. Well, that's exactly what they are. Life-size at one time, but isn't it remarkable the way they shrink them down? Look at this one. See his little features, perfect in every detail. He's my favorite. Interesting history about him. He was once a white man. Oh. Forced down in the South American jungle when his plane cracked up. The headhunters got hold of him, and there he is. His name is Charlie. I'd like to see him closer. I can unlock the case. No, no, please. Do you mind if I don't look anymore? Oh, dear. I, I keep forgetting people are sometimes shocked by these things. I see them only through a collector's eyes. Oh, well, you'll have lots of time to look over my jungle paraphernalia. Meanwhile, perhaps you'd better get some rest. Would you like Victor to get you something to eat? No, thank you, Uncle Peter. But I am rather tired. I, I think I'll say good night to you. Know your way about, do you? Yes, I'll, I'll find my room. Good night, Uncle Peter. Good night, my sweet child. I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> Poor Marie. Know something? You're going to have dreams tonight. Unpleasant ones, too. <laughs> Well, let's move the clock ahead and go to Marie's bedroom. It's a little after three in the morning. She's asleep now. The rain's still coming down. The wind moans outside. Hear it? Yes, Marie's asleep. Looks peaceful enough lying there in that big four-poster bed. But suddenly she begins to toss. Mm. My name's Charlie. Mm. My name's Charlie. My name's Charlie. My name's Charlie. No, no, no. Uncle Peter! Oh. Oh, how foolish. Only a dream. But it seems so real. I'm sure I heard it whisper. My name's Charlie. Only the wind. Oh, I wish I hadn't seen that dreadful thing. Miss Medford, are you all right? Who's there? Clay Alden. Oh, oh yes, Mr. Alden. I, uh, I just had a bad dream, that's all. I'm quite all right, thank you. Well, if you need anything, just ring. Yes, I will. Sorry I disturbed you. Not at all. Oh, I, I must get some sleep. Stop dreaming. But little sleep for you, Marie. <laughs> The moments tick by with dreadful slowness. Fearing to close her eyes, she lies staring at the roof of her bed, lying in agony for the moment when that hideous little head will again come floating in through space. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
It is morning now. A dreary fog still hovers depressingly over the old house. A cold clamminess which only adds to Marie's sensation of uneasiness. In the dismal morning room, Victor is serving breakfast to Clay Alden and Marie. Shame you didn't rest well last night, Miss Medford. It's just the newness of everything. I'll get used to it, Victor. I hope you will, Miss. Of course you will. Oh, and Mr. Alden, um, don't mention anything to my uncle about that silly dream I had last night. Oh, of course not. Did you have a bad night, Miss? Yes. The daytime makes such a difference in things. Even you seem different, Mr. Alden. For the better, I trust. Oh, sorry. That wasn't very complimentary. Oh, here comes Uncle. Well, good morning, you two. Good morning, Mr. Medford. Morning, Uncle Peter. You look quite fit this morning, sir. Feeling splendidly. Had the best night's sleep and I don't know how long. And how are you feeling, my child? Quite well, thank you, Uncle. Oh, uh, you remember our conversation of last evening? I mean, about you wanting to do something? Yes. I think I've got it for you. A friend of mine named Phineas Drake collects books, just purchased a library complete, wants someone to catalog it for him. Small pay, but not too difficult. Well, how does it sound to you? Oh, it sounds wonderful. It's just what I want. <laughs> Splendid. I'll call him again after breakfast. Can you imagine such an ambitious young girl, Alden? Wants to work, and she's only worth a cool million. Oh, not yet. I'm not, Uncle Peter. Well, whenever you become of age, or whatever it said in your father's will. I thought you knew what it said. I won't inherit my cool million until I'm married. What was that, Miss Medford? You see? Right away you put notions into his head. She said she won't come into her inheritance until she marries. Why her father made that strange provision, I shall never know. But, Marie, you stay your distance from this young man. Oh, Uncle Peter, you're making him embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> Can't an old man have his little joke? Anyway, with all the eligible young men you'll meet, poor Alden won't stand a chance. <laughs> oh, Peter, please. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. All right, all right, all right. Victor, uh, where are my eggs? Right here, sir. Oh, yes, soft-boiled eggs. That's your diet. Tell me, my dear, did you find your room comfortable? Oh, yes, it's a lovely room. It's almost like a castle. Oh, I miss my old room, the one next to yours. I haven't been up there in over a month. One day soon, I'll have Victor and Alden carry me up those stairs just to see if the place looks the same. Victor, serve my niece some more coffee. Yes, yes, of course, sir. going to have something to do, eh? Well, you're an intelligent girl. Should do well at your new assignment. It's harder work than you thought, though. Hours of scanning small print and copying down the individual histories of countless books. All goes well for several weeks. And then early one afternoon, you return home, Marie, to find your uncle as usual in his study. Why are you so upset, Marie? <laughs> uncle Peter? Marie! Well, you're home early. You're not finished already. Finished as far as Mr. Phineas Drake is concerned. I, I can't understand it. I've done my work well. This afternoon, Mr. Drake came to me and said he had no further use for my services. What? Didn't explain why, just... Just looked at me queerly and said he preferred someone else to finish the job. Well, that's strange. Oh, well, he's an old crank. Don't let this upset you. We'll find something else for you to do. No, 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 no. Don't you worry. <laughs> but what's, what, what's wrong with my work, Mr. Palanto? Surely it's been satisfactory. Well, you see, because of the uh, peculiar nature of my profession, I, I must have someone more experienced. Uh, I'm sorry, Miss Medford. But I didn't, Professor Handley. I did exactly as you instructed. What on earth is wrong? <clears throat> uh, you'll excuse me, Miss Medford, but uh, well, your ability as an assistant has not come up to standard. Please listen, Dr. Humphrey. I've studied botany, and I, I've checked this manuscript most carefully. There's not a single mistake. Very sorry, Miss Medford, but they're not all acceptable. Have to get someone else. Why, I 
just can't understand it, Uncle Peter. Is there something wrong with me? Well, I, I shall certainly call Dr. Humphrey right away. Oh, no. No, I'd rather you didn't. But it was only the other day he telephoned me and said, what an efficient secretary I thought you were. Something wrong somewhere. Ah, uh, you, you know, Marie, I, I think I'd give up this idea of wanting to work. I haven't mentioned it to you, but you're really not looking your best lately. Well, to tell the truth, Uncle, I... I haven't been sleeping well. I have the most frightening nightmares. In fact, it's the same dream every night. Well, that's odd. What's the dream about? Well, I, uh... I keep seeing that little head. The one you said was called Charlie. Oh, dear. I, I suppose I made a mistake showing that to you on your first night. If you could only look upon Charlie as I do, you'd realize it is an animate dead with no power at all to do you harm. You build up a phobia about that head. Now, the thing to do is to destroy that fear by facing it. You come along with me, my dear. You mean in there again? It's the only way. Now, come along. Oh, no, Uncle Peter. I know what I'm doing. Open that door, Marie. I'm going to make you realize how foolish you've been. Over here, my dear. Oh, I know you think I'm being cruel, but I know my psychology. I... Why, that's strange. What is it, Uncle Peter? Why, somebody's broken into this case. Ring for Victor and get Alden here at once. Is something missing? Somebody has deliberately taken that head. <laughs> so Charlie is missing, eh? wonder who could have broken the lock and lifted the little head from its black velvet pad. <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> but now, several nights have passed, and still the head called Charlie has not reappeared. Marie has just taken a sedative her Uncle Peter gave her and is now lying on her bed, tossing fretfully, praying for sleep. <laughs> sleep, Marie. Tonight? Oh, dear heaven. No dreams tonight. Let me get some sleep. My name's Charlie. No. My name's Charlie. No. My name's Charlie. No. Yes. No, You're no. holding me in your hands, Marie. Ah! Ah! Uncle Peter! Uncle Peter! Uncle Peter! What's wrong, Miss Medley? Where's my uncle? He's downstairs asleep. Well, you're frightened out of your wits. Another of those dreams? It was no dream this time. The head. It's there in my room. What? It told me to open my eyes and look at it. And, and there it was in my hands. I, I threw it to the floor. Oh, I know dreams can seem terribly oh, real, this but... This no dream, I tell you. It's there now in my room. When I threw it on the floor, it, it rolled to the foot of my bed. Oh, don't look at me as though I'm a thing. Come look for yourself if you don't believe me. Just as you say. It's right here. I'll turn on this lamp here. Now it... It's gone. It was here. It was. I saw it as plainly as I can see you. Oh, I know you think I'm crazy. But I saw it. I saw it. I tell you, I saw Miss it. Miss Medford, please. What's wrong, Miss Medford? I thought I heard you scream. Marie. It's your uncle. Are you all right? I'm coming down, Uncle Peter. I'm going to talk to you. Now, 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 you must get hold of yourself, my dear. Oh, you don't think I'm crazy. But I really get to see it. Nestled like an like an orange in my hand. I woke up and, and threw it on the floor. And when Mr. Alden and I came back to the room, it was gone. Oh, you don't believe I actually saw it. Do you? Now, now compose yourself, Charlie. I want to ask you some questions. First of all, in this dream, do you hear a voice of any kind? Yes. Yes. A voice that whispers, My name's Charlie. Over and over. But tonight it, it said something different. Now, it you said... needn't go on, my dear. I had hoped and prayed with all my heart that this wouldn't happen to you. But I'm afraid it has. What are you trying to tell me, Uncle Pete? You've heard me go on about the fine old Medford stock. Well, it so happens our branch isn't so fine. There's been something wrong with us. You mean... Insanity? Oh! Well, there is insanity in the family. 
Why haven't I heard of it before? Because, my dear, it's it's the Medford secret. Oh. Oh, Peter. I'm frightened. Whatever you do, Marie, you must not let go of your Sally. But it's not easy being told you're mad. Uncle Peter, if I am afflicted, then, then all those people must have known. That's why they discharged me. But how did they know? What did I do that would give evidence? Perhaps, perhaps you do things you're not aware of. Maybe I do. Seems the only logical answer. Oh, Uncle Peter. What's to become of me? Now, 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 we'll work this out together, my dear child. No one will ever know. You can depend upon me. I won't leave you. From tonight on, I shall be taken upstairs and I'll stay near you. Knowing that which afflicts us gives us a weapon with which to fight it. Just you rely upon me, my dear. Uncle Peter. Uncle Peter. Yes, who is it? Play Alden. I'm up for you for a moment. Very well. Quietly. Something wrong? Terribly wrong. The old gentleman's asleep in the next room. I had to wait till he dozed off before I could see you. Well? It's about the head. The head? The one he calls Charlie. It's back in its case. When did this happen? Sometime last night, I guess. After your nightmare. Yes, I'm convinced now that that's all it was. I am not so sure. What? When you threw Charlie to the floor, a piece of his ear broke off. I found it after you went downstairs. Here, yeah, here it is. It's Charlie's ear, all right. I checked it very carefully. Oh, no, this doesn't make sense. Did you ring for me, miss? No, no, Victor, no, I... I didn't ring. Oh, sorry, miss. Excuse me. Miss Redford, you're in grave danger. You've got to leave this house as quickly as you can and never come back. What's going on in here? Uncle. What was that I heard you telling my niece, Clay? I said she should leave this house and never come back. Oh, the impudence. Alden, explain yourself. I'll be glad to, sir. I think Miss Medford is in danger of losing her sanity as well as her life. What is all this poppycock? Are you trying to frighten my niece? Lord knows she's been through enough She's been through too much. If she weren't made of pretty stout stuff, she'd have been a gibbering idiot by this time. Alden, you're packing your things and leaving at once. Leaving? I'm afraid you're wrong, sir. I'm not leaving. Not yet. Maybe you're leaving. Well, Mr. Alden, what's the meaning of this? I'm sorry to break it to you this way, but I'm definitely convinced your uncle is a diabolical fiend. I can take so much and no more. Look here, Alden. If you know what's good for you, you'll leave here at once. At once, do you hear? You're pretty anxious to get rid of me, but it's too late. Miss Medford, you remember your father's will. You'd come into your money only if you married. Well, if you didn't marry, Uncle Peter would get the money. And if he could prove you were insane, you'd never be able to marry. You see how it all works out? Well, how dare you, Mr. Listen Alden? Listen to that maniac. Listen to me, Miss Medford. Your uncle, your loving uncle, was the one who telephoned your employers and told them you were crazy. Phineas Drake and all the others told me so today. I don't believe lies, it. Lies, lies, lies. Why, your uncle even told me you were crazy. I know what's happened. He himself smashed the lock and took the head from its case and planted it last night in your room. If you'll stand on a chair and look above your bed as I did this afternoon, you'll see a small radio loudspeaker. It's hooked up to a microphone in the back stairs hallway. The voice you heard was your Uncle Peter. I don't believe you. Last night, after you came out in the hallway, your Uncle Peter grabbed up the head, stepped out onto that balcony, and climbed down the vines to his study. Why, he's as mad as a March hare. How could I possibly be a party to such a monstrous plot? Why, I can't even walk. Look, look at this ear, a piece of Charlie's ear. I found it in Marie's room. That proves she wasn't dreaming, and it fits perfectly. I've tried it. Why, you... Give me that ear. Give it to me! Uncle Peter! You're walking! Give it to me! Look, look at him, Marie, standing unaided. Does that prove anything to you? Uncle Peter! Oh! And it's true. All right. All right, it's true. I can walk. But you are insane, Marie. Insane! You'll never marry anyone, Marie. I'll see to that. Victor, grab him. Don't move, Mr. Medford. Easy now. Don't believe what Alden says. You're crazy, Marie. There's no escaping it. You'll have those dreams, and Charlie will visit you every night. You'll hear him saying, my name's Charlie. My name's Charlie. My name's Charlie. <laughs> Hold him, Victor. <laughs> Got him, sir. Oh, I think you're the one who's crazy, Medford. Maybe that could be proved. Take your hands off me. Take it easy now, Mr. Medford. Take it easy. There's nothing wrong with me. You know it. Is the car ready, Victor? Yes, it's ready. Come in, gentlemen. 
These are the officers. Yeah, then you'd better take him away. Yes, sir. Please come quietly, Mr. Medford. I'm not crazy. I'm not. Hello. You're lying on me. Lying. Lying. Do you hear? You're lying. I... I'm terribly sorry about this, Marie. Terribly sorry. But it's all for the best. But how can it be for the best? But think what this means. He's my father's brother, and if he's insane, then... then it means that I might be too. Remington of Hamlet. No, no, don't worry, Marie. Don't worry, you're safe. You're perfectly normal, I know. You know? Yes. You see, he wasn't your real uncle. He was your father's foster brother. I found proof. So you see, you've nothing, nothing in the world to fear. How do you know that? Someday, Marie, I'll tell you all about it. Tomorrow, maybe. <laughs> Why don't you tell her now, Clay? Tell her why you were working as Peter Medford's secretary. Because your father was Peter's partner, his partner. That your father was ruined in business by Peter and killed himself. Killed himself in disgrace. That you suspected him of having cheated your father. That you came to find the evidence and discovered in time Peter's diabolical plan to prevent Marie from ever marrying. Better tell her, Clay. <laughs> I would. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Tonight's Whistler story was written by Joseph Kearns, directed by J. Donald Wilson, and originated from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time... I, the Whistler... ...tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. be careful of the means. Dan McKay was a man who knew when acquired what he wanted. Power, wealth. But in his rise to the head of a large gambling syndicate, he had also acquired enemies. What do you think it was? What am I paying you for? It's the third time in a week somebody's tried to kill me. Hey, Mr. McKay, I... Get out there! Ferguson. McKay sent for me. What for? Look, I'm a private investigator. License number 17949. Private investigator? Let him in, Corby. Since you can't take care of this job for me, I'm taking it off your hands. Look, Mr. McKay, I'm... I said let him in. Ferguson. Yeah? Leave your car. Walk up.
Which one of you has seniority? Well, you're thinking up a clever answer. Can I come in? Look, don't get sore at me, little man. Can I help it if you're not up to playing bodyguard? Come in. Not you, Corby. As I told you on the phone, Ferguson, somebody's trying to kill me. That's unusual? This time, yes. Started with a letter I received a week ago, threatening my life. First, I thought it was the work of some crackpot. And they made three passes at me. You got that letter? Look, um, you got a good setup here. You can hide yourself behind your steel fence and your bodyguards. If you stay indoors, there's no chance of anybody getting close enough to you to do any damage. Why worry? I'm not worried, Ferguson. And why'd you hire me? Let's say uh, I'm amused. My curiosity's been aroused. This whole thing intrigues me. Why don't you give it up, McKay? Three straight misses on your own table? I think you're real scared. You seen today's paper? No. So a couple of citizens received the same threatening letters, eh? Four. There was another one in last night's paper. A man named Jack Sheldon. Julie Roberts, hat check girl. Albert Dobbs, hardware clerk. Jack Sheldon, traveling salesman. And Dan McKay, businessman. Mm -hmm. Do you know any of these other people? No. She's a real good looking doll. Four strangers, each marked by the same killer. Why? Must be some connection. Ferguson, I want you to find out what that link is. What connects me with a hat check girl, the little guy that sells hardware, the traveling salesman? I want you to find out all there is to know about them, where they're from, who they know, what they've done, everything. Sure. I'll call you. We both need lessons. <clears throat> yeah? Well, I got a date to talk things over with Julie Roberts. Dobbs? No. Now, he skipped out of his rooming house right after he got the threatening letter. And uh, as for Sheldon, the traveling salesman, he's traveling. Look, I'm paying you plenty. You find those two people. I want to talk to them. Sure, sure, sure. But it's going to take time. Oh, uh, by the way, McKay, somebody else received one of those threatening letters. A guy named Gino Bravelli. Bravelli. I never heard of him. Put him on the list. Talk to him. Yeah, I did talk to him. He won't answer. What do you mean he won't answer? Bravelli met with an accident. Admit it, do you, McKay? 
But the news that the killer has claimed his first victim is more than a little disturbing, isn't it? At first, when you received the letter threatening your life, you shrugged it off, casually dismissed it as the work of a crank. Then, in swift succession, three attempts were made on your life. Now, a man named Bravelli is dead. A man who, along with the others, received a threatening letter, similar to the one sent to you. What'd you find out? Who's Ravelli? What'd he do? He was a window washer, McKay. It seems that he fell out of a 20-story office window last night. Looked like an accident until that letter arrived at his house this morning. Ravelli was already dead when the letter arrived? That's right. Why mail a letter to a man after you've already killed him? Well, maybe the killer saw an opportunity to knock Bravelli off ahead of schedule and took it. You think that's what happened? No, no, no. I think the killer heard about Bravelli's accident and decided to make you sweat a little. So he penned a note to Bravelli. You get it? Yes. Yes, I do. Your nerves are showing, McKay. Here's a report on Julie Roberts. Hat check girl faces life. She's really a sweet kid. She is. Yeah. What about Sheldon? He's still out of town. There's no sign of Dobbs yet either. But I've got a couple of leads to run down on him. You better get going. haven't you? But the report on Julie Roberts has revealed absolutely nothing. Not a single link to connect the two of you and the mysterious threat against your lives. It's Ferguson. He's here? Well, it's about time. Three days now. Not a word. No, Mr. McKay, he's not here. It's just that I found out something. Ferguson's been going around town asking a lot of questions. That's what I pay him for. Only the questions he's asking are about you. I don't like that. I don't like anybody prying into my... Wait a minute. How did you find out? I had one of the boys tailing him. I just thought it would be a good idea. Get away from that window! Maybe I've misjudged you, Carl. Ferguson's been spending a lot of time with this Julie Roberts dame. They're getting real chummy. What else did you find out? Max tailed him two days in a row to some little hotel on Sylvester Street. Only it wasn't until a little while ago he found out who Ferguson was seeing there. Dobbs. Albert Dobbs. Funny he ain't told you anything about finding him, huh? I told you not to answer. This is Ferguson. That wasn't by any chance the Roberts girl who answered. Yeah. I thought it'd be safer for her to stay at my place while I'm away. That's right. I'm leaving now, flying down to L.A. I think I'm onto something. Maybe we're onto something too, Ferguson. All right. But come out here the minute you get back. Understand? He's leaving town. Still didn't mention Dobbs? Nor Sheldon. Gotta get moving, Corby. 
I think Ferguson wants more than his fee. If he can put this puzzle together before I do, he might be able to cause me some trouble. Ferguson's. Well, he isn't here right now. I'd like to talk to you anyway, Julie. But I don't know you. I... It's infuriating, isn't it? You thought a talk with Julie Roberts would solve your problem, give you what you're looking for. But it hasn't, has it? Instead, the hours of questioning her have revealed nothing. Absolutely nothing. Miss Roberts, I'm a little tired of asking. I want to know everything that Ferguson left out of that report. Everything you know about me. I tell you, I don't know anything more. You've got to believe me. You said that, sister. That's all you've been saying. Please. I've told you everything I know. Please leave me alone. It's getting awfully late, and my patience is... Well, Ferguson, you got back from Los Angeles in a hurry. Julie, are you all right? Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Relax, of course she's all right. Get out, McKay. Please, Frank, don't. Oh, so now it's Frank. Cozy. Get out and take your monkey with you. I don't know what you're up to. But I hired you to handle this. Yeah, I'm handling it my way. You're the investigator, Ferguson. Just remember, I'm used to getting what I pay for. Good night, Miss Roberts. Mm -hmm. The pressure is building, isn't it? Since Julie wasn't any help to you, your only hope now is Dobbs, that he holds the key to the mystery. That once you've talked with him, heard his story, you can add things up. And you've got to add things up, McKay, soon, before it's too late. I hope Mr. Dobbs won't mind my letting you in like this. We're old friends. We just want to surprise him. Yeah. Lock the door, will you? dog in the alley. Knock the lid off a can. Never seen you like this before, jumpy-like. It's not like you. It's all right, so I'm jumpy. What do you expect? I don't like this setup, Carl. I don't like it at all. I've always known who my enemies were. I've always been able to take care of them. Ever since I was a kid, all I ever had to do was to get my hands on them. This time, I don't know who I'm up against. I don't know who's for me or against me. Oh, except you, Carl. You're the only one I trust, Carl. What's keeping this guy? Why don't he show? Maybe he's really scared. Skip Tom. Scared? Yeah, maybe he's scared. You know, it's funny. Before you get in a letter, nothing to connect you, nothing to tie up. All right, all right. We've been over all that. Why don't you tell me something I don't know? Why ask me? That's Ferguson's job. Carl, I already told you. You're the only one I trust. Yeah, you told me. This whole thing is like a nightmare. What's a man supposed to do? How do you fight your way out of a nightmare? How do you fight something you can't even see? Something you can't get a hold of? You have to keep trying. Don't worry, you'll figure something out. You and Ferguson. 
Never mind, Ferguson. I'm working this out with you now. All right, so you're working it out with me now. You must have made one enemy sometime in your life. Who doesn't? Everybody makes enemies. What's the difference? Well, it seems to make quite a difference now. All the enemies I ever made, I took care of them as I went along. Well, there must be one you didn't take care of. That's just it. I wonder who it can be. Who did I step on that I can't remember? Might be better if you never found out. What do you want me to do? Wait around like a sitting duck until he finds me? No, you can't do that. the police. I'm in the same boat as you are. I got a letter, too. Be much safer to come along. We can talk everything over on the way. On the way? Where? To my place. Talk as much as we like there. Maybe add things up. Find out who's trying to kill us. I don't know. I can't trust anyone. It might even be you. Could I see your letter? kill you, Mr. Dobbs. No idea at all. No. No. No idea at all. You don't know the Roberts girl or Jack Sheldon. That you're frightened, aren't you? Yes. Yes, I am. All right. Suppose you start in. From the beginning. I want you to tell me everything there is to know about yourself, Mr. Dobbs. Where you're from, where you've been, what you've done, who you know, everything. I... I see. Go on. Well, I... I was born in Portland, Oregon. Portland. Might as well pull up a chair, Corby. This might take a long time, but I've got a hunch it's gonna be worth it. As a small boy, I... didn't have many friends. Stayed pretty much by myself. Only... my brother. He was older. You know how those things are. How a smaller boy always looks up to a bigger one. I guess I was pretty much of a nuisance to him at times. Once, my brother built a tree house. Oh, it was wonderful. So high, so very much away from everything. Even more than your place here, Mr. McKay. Much more. Well, let me see. Must have been about two years after that that I... No. No, it was about a year after that that I went back to Los Angeles. Where did you live there? On 54th Street near Figueroa. What did you say? 54th Street. I had a small flat near the... What's the matter, Mr. McKay? Your thoughts are racing back through the years, aren't they? Back to an unfortunate little affair on 54th Street in Los Angeles. It was nearly 20 years ago, wasn't it? Yes, you remember the night well. You were just getting started then. Selling protection. That was the night, wasn't it, that your methods of persuasion proved fatal. The night you killed a man who ran a grocery store. Corby. Yeah? 
You better turn in and get some sleep. Oh, that's all right. I don't think I can sleep. Corby, you better turn in. And the boss. Dobbs, about 54th Street in L.A. If you'll tell me a little bit more, I'm certain we can identify our would-be killer. It's all over, isn't it, McKay? Yes, you're certain now that it's only a matter of minutes before you'll be able to put the pieces of the puzzle together. The story that Mr. Dobbs has just told you. It's proved very helpful, hasn't it? And his words have finally established the link with the past. Hello. Hello, Ferguson. What do you want? You can thank Julie for this call, McKay. I was in favor of letting you sweat. But I guess I'd better tell you. I found your man. His name is Maxwell. He plans to kill you and then give himself up. Yeah, yeah, I remember that grocer being murdered. Not that I had anything to do with it. You mean they were never able to pin it on you? Well, this guy couldn't get close to you, but he figured out a way to get you to come after him. He sent a couple of letters to strangers, then one to himself, and then one to you. I don't get it, Ferguson. He knows you'll want to talk to him. But the first time he gets you alone, he'll kill you. The guy is a dead grocer's brother. His name is Maxwell. Only we know him as Albert Dobbs. Search is over, McKay. An acquiring power. A man must be careful of the means. Now, folks, it's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.